Ms. Griffith, would you please call the roll? Mr. Armenter? Ms. Berrios? Here. Mr. Campbell? Hazelot? Here. Mr. Clark? Here. Ms. Gonzalez? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Ms. Jones? Here. I'm sorry, Ms. Valencia Jones? Here. Ms. Jessica Jones? Here. Mr. Laborde? Here. Ms. Martin? Mr. Mitchell? Here. Mr. Murray? Mr. Nelson? Here. Ms. Slaughter? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. Mr. Starnes? Ms. Wagner? Here. Ms. Werner? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. Mr. Chairman, there's a quorum. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, again. And at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to the folks from Parker to continue with the process. We're waiting on the next candidate to join. Okay. So he'll be here shortly. I'd like to welcome Board of Supervisors members, Collis Temple and Lee Mallet. Thank you for being with us. Mr. Darden has joined, so if you would turn your camera on, we are ready to proceed. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll jump in with the first question. Good afternoon, Mr. Darden. Good afternoon. Would you please give us a five minute overview of how your experience has prepared you to be president of LSU? First of all, let me thank all of you for participating in this process. I know it's an arduous one and a difficult one to do by Zoom, but I, I appreciate it very much. I want to start with a little off resume uh, item. Um, I grew up with LSU in my blood. My dad ran a 9900 yard dash in the early 1930s for Plaquemine High School and was offered a track scholarship to LSU. He couldn't take it because he had to go to work to support his parents. He was an only child and he always regretted never being able to have an education, particularly one from LSU. My grandmother on my mother's side was a member of the first graduating class at SLI or Southwestern, now ULL. All five of her children graduated from that institution. Uh, mom became a, an LSU fan, of course, but uh, higher education was instilled in me at a very early age. And, and LSU has been a part of my life ever since. In fact, every success I've had um, in my life has been the result of my upbringing in Baton Rouge and my education at LSU. Um, Experience-wise, I go back to my days on the campus of LSU. I, I had the very good fortune of being president of the student body. Um, in fact, I was the last member, mess, student body president to serve on the LSU board who couldn't vote. Uh, my introduction to the legislative process was to testify in favor of a bill by the senator whom I later succeeded uh, to let the student members of the boards of supervisors vote. Uh, it was a very important lesson to me because I was provided input and discussion rights, but when it came time to vote, I couldn't have a say. That made a big impression on me back then. Uh, since my graduation from LSU, though, I've been involved at LSU at every level. I was president of the East Baton Rouge chapter of the Alumni Association. I was on the union governing board as an alumni representative. And then, of course, in my, my public career as a senator, I represented LSU. It was in my district the entire 16 years that I served in the Louisiana State Senate. Uh, during that time, I had the opportunity to, to work with higher education and in particular with LSU to advance causes important to higher education. Uh, funding was always an issue. In fact, I, I will tell you that I, I wrote a letter going back to my student body president days about the woeful funding for higher education that I still read in legislative settings because unfortunately it's still applicable today. Uh, but my time in the Senate as the finance chairman gave me a real insight as to higher education, a real insight as to what LSU's needs were. Um, I've enjoyed really four decades of, of leadership position within the state in various capacities that have exposed me 
uh, to LSU and to universities across the state. Um, in my current role as Commissioner of Administration, of course, I'm in charge of the state budget. I'm, I'm responsible for preparing the budget, making recommendations on the budget. And this has afforded me, afforded me some really great insight as to the operations of, of Board of Regents, the various management boards. More importantly, as it relates to LSU, for the past five years, I've been integrally involved, too much so, some would say, in the uh, dealings with hospitals under the uh, management of, of co coordinated management with LSU and the medical schools. Um, that's an insight that not very many people have, and, and that's an important part of, of understanding LSU's needs, and particularly the needs of those two campuses, the New Orleans campus and the Shreveport campus, and the needs of the physicians and the employees who work there, and making certain that funding possibilities uh, for those two universities are paramount when it comes to their relationship with hospitals. Um, I've left things better than I've found them. I've tried to do that, both as Secretary of State, as Lieutenant Governor, and now as Commissioner of Administration. And as I approach this job, I will, I will conclude by, by telling you three things. Number one, I know what I do not know. And I recognize that there are things I do not know. I know that I don't have all the answers. And I know how important it is to listen to all the stakeholders involved in LSU, be you student, faculty member, staff member, or alumni. And if I am fortunate enough to be selected as the president and chancellor, I will not let our university fail under any circumstances. Thank you. Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you for joining us today. What's your vision for LSU as an eight institution system, including LSU Act Center and health centers, like you mentioned? Please describe short and long-term goals and metrics to measure your success. Um, let, me, let me start by, by reading you a, a vision that, that I prepared, and it's gleaned, it's not all original, it's gleaned from several different vision statements that, that I've read during the course of, of LSU's uh, transitioning over the past couple of decades, but this is how I would describe the need or a vision for one LSU. A statewide integrated flagship system with centers of excellence on each campus, recognized for academic achievement, robust research, and a culture of, mode, of uh, innovation and service. Now, that's, that's, those are words. That's a summary of what a vision may look like in one person's mind, but uh, frankly, what my vision of this eight member system uh, should be is not as important as what your vision should be and what the stakeholders of Louisiana State University believe that vision should encompass. And that's why the first thing I intend to do is to visit in the first 30 to 45 days every campus in this system. I won't need a GPS to get there. I've been there to all of them. I understand where they are. I understand many of the needs that they already have having gone through the budget system but I will sit down with representatives of the faculty, the student body, the staff, and alums in those areas to find out what they think the vision of their respective component of this university system should be. That would help shape what the long-term vision needs to be. Uh, it's gonna involve, it's gonna have to involve a, a more sophisticated strategic plan than we have right now, I believe. One that is coordinated among the eight the eight uh, components of the system, and it is designed to make each one of them as successful as they can possibly be. Um, as you know, I have talked about my perception uh, that the structure of university leadership needs to be considered and needs to be reconsidered. And I know as, as you talked about the organizational structure, your committee uh, talked about what other options may be available. I think it's important that we have input from all eight of the campuses to talk about that structure and to have a candid discussion of what the structure ought to look like. I've responded to this application knowing that I would be the president of the system and the leader of the Baton Rouge campus as well. But I do think it's important to have that discussion about what that structure ought to look like. I would certainly envision because in fact, one of your earlier questions, they were revised just a couple, few hours ago. I saw the revisions unfortunately a little bit late um, but the earlier component of this question talked about strengths and weaknesses, and I think it's important to talk about that, and it was omitted from the revised version, but um, the weakness that I acknowledge is that I am not a faculty member. I do not have any administrative experience on a college campus. I recognize that, and I, 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 I want to confront that and deal with that, that challenge, but I think the strengths that I have greatly outweigh uh, that as a perceived weakness. 
Um, it, it's important to recognize a person's ability to communicate, a person's ability to listen, a person's knowledge base coming into a job opportunity, given the challenges that exist right now, all of which I believe are strengths and that prepare me to, to deal with the challenges that uh, this university faces right now. Um, we have to remember that, that we are a land grant university. And in, in that regard, we're responsible for the academic success of the students who matriculate on our campuses. We must be responsible for a robust research program and a coordinated robust research program that, that I think needs some work. And equally importantly, we have to recognize that our mission is one of service. Uh, as, as the original land grant concept was put forward, it's to educate the sons and daughters of toil. And we're uniquely positioned to do that in this system with the Ag Center and the Ag School, with our two medical uh, advanced degree programs, professional schools, uh, with our two-year program at Eunice, with the four-year program in, 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 at LSUS, with the four-year program at A, and obviously with the flagship main campus here in Baton Rouge, each having a unique ability to, to meet the guidelines of um, this university and of a land-grant system. Um, the metrics, and, and this, is, this was the, the late addendum to the question that I just saw a very short time ago, so I don't know that I can give you a huge number of metrics, but I, I believe the specific metrics we would look at are, are not going to be foreign to anybody. That would be uh, basics like uh, graduation rate, uh, enrollment, um, student success, research dollars, uh, productivity, uh, institutional productivity, and what have you. Um, I will be interested in finding out from the advocates on each of those campuses that I mentioned uh, what metrics they believe are achievable. We ought to have short-term metrics that we can achieve in a relatively short period of time, and we ought to have a long-term vision about how each campus can be successful, but working as part of a whole, working as part of a system that has coordinated leadership at the top and moves and, and takes advantage of the strengths of each of those individual campuses. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nelson. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Can you please describe your leadership style with emphasis on hiring, delegation, and decision making? Um, yes, and, and, and let me just say, my experience in working with Dr. Nelson, working with Dr. Golly, working with the folks on both those medical school campuses uh, is an important attribute that I believe I have to understand the challenges that they face in working with partner hospitals and also in, in uh, having a long-term vision for where their best research dollars can be invested. So uh, from, a, from a leadership style, it, it is collaborative. Uh, I believe in bringing people together and I believe in listening uh, more than talking and, and understanding what people believe are the keys to success in whatever entity they may be involved in. Um, I believe in being proactive, not reactive. And that is certainly uh, something that, that LSU needs to be very cognizant of right now as we, as we go through the challenges we faced over the course of the past year. We need to be proactive in anticipating issues and not simply always being in a reactive mode where we have to hurry up and, and do something because uh, something has, has happened. Uh, I like to, um, to I, I have led by example. Uh, certainly in my, my leadership roles before I entered public service, I like to get my hands dirty. I, I had the, and I think I, I tell people who are interested in going into politics that they should follow the course that I followed. Uh, I was the president of 10 different nonprofit entities before I decided to run for public office. I got my hands dirty. I did what needed to be done to make events successful, make programs successful, and to, to lead by example. And that's one of the most important things I believe a leader can do and certainly ought to do on a, on a university campus or for a university system. Um, I've been guided by a, a principle of Mark Twain's. I'm not a complete fan of Mark Twain because he didn't like the old state capital, as many of you know, which is one of my favorite buildings in Louisiana. But, uh, but Mark Twain said, always do right. This will gratify some people and astonish the rest. And that's kind of been a, a hallmark of, of what I've tried to do in exhibiting leadership skills and what have you. From a public service standpoint, having, been, having served in the Senate for 16 years, an important part of leadership is to recognize it, not to take everything personal, uh, not to take setbacks personally. They're gonna be setbacks. They're gonna be discussions where you don't win all the time. And, and it's important to remember that there, there are other times when the people who are opposed to you on one day may very well be your allies on the next day. And so I think recognizing that component is very, very important as well. 
I also tell people don't go along to get along. Uh, it's easy to just go along with what the majority always thinks because uh, that's going to make you popular with them. But sometimes you got to say, no, that's not the right thing to do. I have a button here on my desk. In fact, it's right here. I have a button here on my desk. Um, it says no. Uh, when I came into this job as commissioner of administration, no. I had to hit that button a lot because a lot of people were asking for things and I had to make sure that we said no. We had a $2 billion budget deficit that the governor charged me with digging out from under. And so I had to tell people no, and we had to set priorities. And that's part of what you have to do as a, as a leader. Uh, when I was in the Senate and had to vote, when you members of the board have to vote, you've got a green button and a red button. You don't have a yellow button and you go looking for that yellow button all the time, but you've got to make a decision between green and red. And a leader has to be decisive and a leader has to be willing to recognize that every time you go one way or the other, you're going to alienate somebody that was on the other side. Um, and I've had to make unpopular decisions. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, but I also believe in a lean management structure. Everywhere I've been, I have been surrounded by competent, good, hardworking, dedicated people, few in number. Uh, when I was elected Lieutenant Governor, I did not hire a secretary of the Department of Culture, Recreation and Tourism that had been in place for, for years. It was a dual responsibility. I was the elected official. I was responsible for running the department. I saved 125,000 or whatever the number was dollars by not hiring that secretary and doing it myself. So I'm used to, to leading by example and I'm used to going in and, and creating a streamlined organization, something that LSU desperately needs. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. I know when we get into some of the other questions, but um, when, it, when it comes to uh, hiring, I wanna hire the best possible person. I wanna hire people who are smarter than I am. I wanna hire self-starters and people who are committed to doing the right thing for the right reasons. Um, when it's time to make decisions, and I'll see if I can pull this up. Well, I don't have, my phone has disappeared. I don't, I, I don't have this uh, by memory, but I will, uh, I like to, to cite General Colin Powell when it comes to decision-making. And, and I, I share this with you because uh, it's the way I go about making decisions. He said, when we're debating an issue, loyalty means giving me your honest opinion, whether or not you think I'll like it. Disagreement of this type stimulates me, but once a decision is made, the debate ends. From that point on, loyalty means executing the decision as if it were your own. And that's precisely what, uh, what we've had to do in the division as we, as we dealt with all these difficult decisions on uh, the monetary challenges that we had, the many hands that were out looking for state support at a time that we didn't have dollars, um, that's what had to be done. But the good news is we've turned things around. We went from a $2 billion deficit to three consecutive years of budget surpluses. Uh, we are proposing and recommending investments for higher education for the first time in 10 years. Uh, the bleak years of the past decade we hope are over. It's a moment in time where, where good things can happen. And that's what's the result of, of good leadership. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Takira Wagner. All right, how are you doing? Good, thank okay. you. <laughs> okay, so you've seen the LSU Title IX issue and too many headlines. How do we make protection of students, faculty, and staff from sexual harassment, discrimination, and assault a hardline priority for all institutions of the LSU system? We certainly are not going to go backwards at this point. Uh, the lessons of the past several months and the, the Title IX challenges that the university has faced has resulted in a revision of policies that I believe is going to be appropriate going forward. Um, I'm not familiar with all the policies that have been put in place yet, but I know that the that Dr. That, yeah, Professor Gallagher and the board uh, have done a great deal to, to finally set some real guidelines and instructions on how things ought to be handled. And it's pretty obvious with the, the uh, use of a million dollars that, that was suddenly identified in order to build up a Title IX program that the financial commitment has been made. And it's been made at the system level. And I think that's important. I think the Title IX office that has been developed needs to be at the system level, needs to be centralized with, with obviously individuals and investigators and people to whom you report on each individual campus with a very clear line, a very direct line and chain of command of where a complaint goes, who investigate it, investigates it, to whom they report, where it goes next. And all this has got to be done in the, in the context of, of remembering two very important principles. 
uh, the constitutional protection of due process for the accused to make certain that the accused does have an opportunity to respond uh, to state his or her case and to not simply be found guilty simply because an allegation is made. But more importantly, the protection for the complainant and the assurance that the privacy rights of the complainant are going to be protected and that the processes that are followed are all designed to make certain that that victim is not put in a position that they do not want to be put in. And, and that's an important component of what's gonna happen as we go forward. It, it's unfortunate, but the, uh, these problems are not unique to LSU. They've obviously been very, very high profile, unfortunately for the university most recently, but campuses across the country, uh, businesses across the country, governmental entities across the country are facing these same type of challenges. And it, it is, as uh, Tom Galligan, I think, said in one of his presentations, it's a cultural issue. And we'll talk a little bit about culture as we, as we go a little bit further. But um, the culture needs to change, and it needs to change in a way where people understand, men more than women, because they're more often the perpetrators, that this is not acceptable behavior. Um, and a university campus is the place where that needs to be magnified. Now, I am not a Johnny come lately to the discussion of domestic violence. Uh, in my law practice, practice, I saw and represented victims of domestic violence. I had friends that I knew who went through these very trying and difficult situations. So when I went to the Senate in 1992, I went with a perspective of trying to do something about this long before it was an issue that was uh, has the prominence and the awareness that it has today. I sponsored and passed legislation that provided additional protection for victims of domestic violence uh, to dating partners and others. Uh, when it was a controversial subject as to how far those protections should extend, they should extend to everybody. Uh, and, and then one of the last bills I passed, in fact, it may have been one of the last bills I passed in the legislature was to create um, a protective registry uh, within the Secretary of State's office and within the judicial system so that victims of domestic violence, again, more often women, could vote and could have a registered place to vote that was not going to be made public because the voting rolls are public and anybody could go online and find out where any one of you votes, get your address, and that is exactly what a victim of domestic violence does not want. They're running from individuals who are looking for them and they wanna make certain they're protected. And I work closely with Justice Kimball to create that protective registry order. Um, so I'm, I'm sensitive to this issue and it is an issue that we're gonna be dealing with going forward. It's an issue that still haunts us over the course of the past several months and is not going away. Uh, over my shoulder is, is a, an award from STAR, the, the organization with whom the university is now uh, partnering. Um, I was one of their first champions of change in 2016 for the work I had done in combating domestic violence. So um, these Title IX issues are, are very important and very sensitive to me. Um, and it also goes to uh, the attitude I've had, and this is a little bit going back to one of the previous questions in terms of um, hiring practices. <laughs> I have always surrounded myself with competent and effective women and black women. Um, in my last role at Lieutenant Governor's Office, five of the eight people on my executive staff were women. Uh, currently in the Division of Administration, four of the eight people on the floor, on my floor here, in our executive staff are women. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate and recognize the importance of uh, individuals who have not always had the same uh, chances to advance. I'm married to a professional woman. My wife, Kathy, is a CPA who, who grew up in the, the business world in the in the late 1970s and early 1980s where it was not as common as it is now. And I understand the, uh, the perspective that, that she brought to her job. So anyway, I digress and I'll go on to the next question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Barrios. Good afternoon. My question is how would you ensure that LSU campuses remain student-centered? Please describe how you interact with and engage students, especially in the area of fostering student success. And how do you incorporate student input and respond to their needs and concerns? All right, thank you, Hannah. Um, I, I'm, I'm 67 years old, and it's, it's hard for me to, to say those words and recognize that I'm as old as I am. But uh, I still hearken back to my days as an undergraduate uh, when I learned the perspective of a student vis-a-vis -vis faculty members and vis-a-vis and -vis administrators. 
uh, the experience I had on the as a student member of the LSU board was was absolutely invaluable. I sat between uh, two of the finest trial lawyers in, in Louisiana, Camille Gravel and Jerry McKernan, and, and learned an awful lot as a law student when I was that member. But I remember the way I was treated as the student member who couldn't vote, and I was treated as an exact equal. Uh, it was I went into it expecting to be patronized or expecting not to be listened to, but quite the contrary, my views were welcomed. And I remember that experience. I, I had a couple of major issues that, that I tackled as the member, the student member of the board. Uh, students used to get into Tiger Stadium by just showing their IDs. And, and the prevailing wisdom at the time was we needed to move away from that as they have now. But I fought that and it didn't happen on my watch. I had a great relationship with the then athletic director, Carl Maddox, but we had a battle over that and I won. And I also remember a, an important battle that dealt with a real issue that was important to students. A professor was not granted tenure because he had not uh, had the requisite research efforts, but he was one of the most popular and effective professors on campus. He was a professor that I had had as an undergraduate, and I championed his cause to, to be tenured, and it was a major issue, and I was respected by those board members, and that's exactly the way I would feel as the president of this university, chancellor of the Baton Rouge campus, is to respect the views of students and to seek out the input of not only the elected student leaders, but also the rank and file students who also have opinions and have thoughts. Um, so that, that perspective is always gonna be with me. I, I remember the way that Paul Merle, then chancellor of LSU interacted with me as a student body president. We had a great relationship and there were things I wanted to have done that couldn't be done. And he would explain to me why they couldn't be done. And there were things and ideas that I had that he, that met with success because he worked with us and he did things that may have been a little bit out of the ordinary. And, and I, that part of my, my heritage, if you will, my recollections is gonna drive my relationship with students. Um, to this day, I speak regularly to student groups across the state. Um, for years, I have spoken at Boys State and Girls State at uh, the Louisiana Youth Academy, at Youth Legislature. And I talk about leadership, the Louisiana Center for Women. In fact, I'm going to be the keynote speaker at their event at Nickel State um, this summer, where they have an event for young women uh, across Louisiana, from all over the state, who come and, and spend two concentrated days of leadership study. And I, I talk about leadership. And I, I've, I've talked about it in many different aspects, but I'll share with you one way that I talk about it, because it talks about the characteristics of leadership that are important. These are important to me as a university president. They're important to a student in a leadership role. And they really are important to anybody who embarks on any kind of leadership challenge. And that is these characteristics, confidence, honesty, integrity, uh, communication, and enthusiasm. And you put all those, the first letter of all those words together and it spells choice because leadership is a choice. We have the opportunity in this country to choose whether or not we want to take on tough responsibilities. I had the opportunity to choose whether or not I wanted to take on this responsibility. And I've never shied away from challenges, never shied away from um, what are seemingly difficult situations that people say, why in the world would you want to do that? Uh, well, it, it's because of those characteristics that I believe I can bring to this job and bring to this university. And an overarching component of, of what I will bring to the university will be a respect for and an ability to interact with and listen to students. And that'll start when I tour each of these eight campuses and it'll continue when I go to lunch with student leaders or when I go to student meetings, uh, whether they invite me or not to listen to what's going on and to make certain that they understand that the leadership of this campus is sensitive to their views and anxious for their input. Thank you. Now, uh, Lori Martin, Dr. Martin. Oh, she's, she's not here. Not I'm here. sorry. Well, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Sir. Um, good afternoon, Commissioner. Hey, Dr. Mitchell. How are you? I am well. I am well. Um, you've alluded to this in parts of other questions. So um, specifically, tell us just your reflections on how you would approach um, leading and working with the faculty. What are your views on faculty governance? Please describe your previous experience in leading, supporting, and a growing research and scholarly activities. Dr. Mitchell, this is going to be 
my biggest challenge, and I recognize that. I think uh, walking in the door, there is going to be suspicion of someone who is a non-traditional candidate, who has not uh, grown up through the system, through the faculty, or, or through leadership positions on campus. And, and I, I recognize that. Um, and, and I embrace that challenge and I'm anxious to, to listen to faculty members and to talk to uh, leadership on the campus about uh, what shortcomings they've seen in the past and what things have been done right in the past. Um, faculty governance is critical, particularly in, in every aspect of academia. Um, my sense is that many faculty members, particularly on the main campus, uh, feel like they have not been listened to. Uh, I talked about being proactive and reactive. They have been uh, told of decisions after the decisions are made instead of having input on the front end. Uh, that would change. Uh, faculty members need to drive all ac academic discussions on every campus. They need to be involved in how decisions are made. Uh, they need to be consulted on what recommendations are gonna be made. And to the extent that that doesn't happen, that's a huge leadership shortcoming. So um, it's not unlike I, I anticipate that dealing with the faculty is not unlike dealing with the legislature. Uh, it's comprised of all sorts of different people who come from different backgrounds, um, different intellects, a high level of intellect, obviously on a, on a college campus, but uh, from different viewpoints. And a leader needs to be receptive to all those viewpoints and willing to, to listen and to not make decisions based solely on the input of one particular person, one particular group. Um, I wanna have an ongoing um, relationship with faculty members. For example, I wanna to go to lunch with every single Boyd professor on campus. Uh, I wanna to, to know what makes them tick and what makes them think and, and how they believe the university can prosper, what they think has been wrong with the university. The same holds true for rank and file faculty members as well as the leadership of the faculty senate, as well as the staff. We can't overlook the staff. And I, I'm in charge of 1600 people in the division of administration. And, and technically, I guess, overseeing 30,000 plus state employees. And I hear from them all the time. And I talk to them regularly to find out how processes can be improved and uh, how things can be made better. And that's an important component of what the leadership of a college campus and a college system ought to be. Um, so I, un I understand clearly uh, the need for faculty to drive academia on campus. And I will have a if I'm in this position right off the bat, I will have an academic leader assisting on the main campus. It'll be a woman in all likelihood, but I'm not gonna walk in the door suggesting that I know everything there is to know about uh, the nuances of academia. But I, I know enough to know people who do, who can advise us and help us shape the destiny of the university. Now, research, let's talk about research because in my estimation, the, the, the literally dozens of people Whose, adv whose advice I have sought and who have contacted me asking me to express my interest in this position. This has been a very interesting and, and continuous topic of discussion because we are lagging in research. It, it is that simple. Uh, King Alexander's strengths were dealing with students and, and he did a, an excellent job of interacting with students, of improving graduation rates, of increasing enrollment. That's another thing we'll talk about when we talk about finances a little bit, but, um, but research has unfortunately uh, not been prioritized. And all you have to do is, is look at numbers. I mean, I've, I've looked at some numbers. I don't have them all committed to memory, but I'm gonna give you a few of the, the numbers that I, I have noted. When LSU became a flagship university in 1987, I think it was, we were in the top 100 uh, research institutes in the country. Uh, we grew, I'm told, as high as 59th. Now, under those same measuring sticks, and these, these measurements were not done by me, but they, they were done by someone who is widely respected on this campus, we probably rank in the 200s, not even the 100s. Um, our share of federal dollars does not reach a level that makes us competitive. Um, federal dollars are, are critical because that's where you get peer-reviewed um, research dollars, that's where you get innovation, that's where you that lead to inventions and lead to revenue for professors and revenue for the university. And the national share of federal research dollars from quality institutions is 53% and LSU is at 37%. That's unacceptable. Um, we have overall decreased in, in the dollars we have put in research and, and that needs to change. It cannot change overnight and it will not change overnight. And I will not be able to snap my fingers or find the money to come in and say, it's gonna change immediately. 
research is a long-term commitment. It is something that doesn't happen overnight. It takes time and obviously it takes money and it takes recruiting the right people. We've been successful at that on the New Orleans Medical School campus. We've been successful at that on the Pennington campus. Uh, those are the two that have seen increased research dollars. And I've worked very closely with both of those institutions in that area in my role as Commissioner of Administration and trying to help identify where dollars can be invested. And they need to be invested, not haphazardly, but on a targeted basis. Every one of our eight institutions has a component of research. Obviously on the two-year campuses, um, it's not as profound as it is on the graduate school level or at LSU. Um, but every institution can be involved in the determination of where research dollars can be prioritized. And we know where they are in Louisiana. There, there are volumes of documents that have pointed us in the right direction. We've had success in engineering. We can have much greater success with the building that we have now and the minds that we have in that school. We know that coastal and environment is a priority for us. We need to target dollars into those areas. And we need to make certain we continue to target dollars into um, agriculture. Um, I, we are an agricultural state. We are a land grant university. We touch everybody in this state uh, with our 4 H programs, with our extension services. And that's where tremendous research is being done and can continue to be done. So we've got to have a, we have, a, have to have a vision. We have to be proactive and we have to make a commitment. And that's what I intend to do. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Clark. Thank you. In a time of limited and even shrinking resources, budgeting and resource allocations are important res responsibilities. Budget cuts to higher education have resulted in many unfilled faculty and staff positions, lagging salaries, fewer graduate students, and higher tuition and overhead fees. How can the LSU system begin to address some of these inequities over the next five years without assuming higher budgets? Well, we, we cannot assume higher budgets, but we can be optimistic that we may have them, at least for the remaining couple of years. Let me say that because we've been able to manage surpluses and we will have a we have an excess right now in the current year budget. Uh, we will have a surplus when this fiscal year ends. And if our economy rebounds, as we hope that it will, um, we will hopefully be postured now uh, that we're not struggling like we have in the past. Um, it, it has been a, an unfortunate vast wasteland for higher education in the previous uh, 10 years. That's changing now. And so I hope we will have some increased resources that will be made available to us. Um, in this budget cycle, of course, we have recommended faculty pay raises. We've recommended uh, mandated expenses for higher education. I, I understand where these dollars are. I understand where these dollars can come from. That's certainly an asset that I can bring to the university based upon the experience I've had as, as commissioner of administration. But let's work on the assumption that, that you've asked, that we're not going to see uh, more dollars coming to uh, higher education. So uh, we've obviously got to look within. The first place we're going to look within is the first place I looked everywhere I've been, Secretary of State, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Division of Administration. Let's look at our administrative costs uh, relative to our academic costs. And I'm going to look at that. I'm going to look very closely at salaries. We have an awful lot of people that make an awful lot of money and they're not in the classroom. And if we reprioritize how we spend money, that's one way to try and identify sources of revenue that may not be otherwise available. These are tough questions and hard decisions that have to be made, and it certainly is not going to make everybody happy. And, and obviously, the solutions that we need in, in higher education, and particularly in LSU, are not going to make everybody happy with every decision that's made. But that's the first place I'm going to look. Um, we're going to have a lean administrative system. Uh, the, the discussion, for example, in years gone by has been, well, when we had a president and a chancellor, for example, we had 70 people working in the system office, and that was just too many, and it, and it was, but if you look a little more carefully, not everybody included in that 70 number were working in the, in the system office. A lot of them were internal auditors spread out all across the state, but then the, the system office shrank to seven people. That's too small. Uh, that is not enough people to effectively govern un eight member institutional system. And so I recognize that there is going to have to be, I think an increase in numbers from seven to adequately administer uh, the LSU system, but it's not gonna, it's gonna be in double figures, but maybe, but it's gonna be in low double figures and people are gonna be compensated based upon what their job responsibilities are. 
uh, and, and they're going to be blended with how those responsibilities overlap with the job responsibilities of the Baton Rouge campus. Because clearly what has happened over the course of the past uh, number of years is that um, the great weight of people has shifted to the Baton Rouge campus. And this is one of the things, Dr. Clark, that, that you and others probably recognize. And I know it's what I hear, and it may not be stated by everybody, but it's certainly what I've heard um, in my role dealing with institutions across the state uh, and even before I was commissioner of administration, there are those who say uh, one person spends too much time on the Baton Rouge campus and ignores everybody else. And others say, well, that person's too busy worrying about the eight institutions and not dealing with Baton Rouge. And that's, therein lies the rub and therein lies the discussion that needs to take place um, at the board level clearly. And, and it did. I, I, know the, I know the board has wrestled with this. And that's why I bring this topic up because we need to confront it. The, in the early days of, of King Alexander's absence, the thought was, let's have two positions. And, and then that changed and went to one position. But there was never really beyond the board level discussion, a discussion that involved the players, the eight institutions and the people I'm talking about on campuses as to what they think works and what they think doesn't work. So um, that, and all that has a component, it has a, has a bearing obviously on, on the budget. I've digressed a little bit, but um, the transition uh, at, advisory team that was established uh, after the, the one LSU was established. I'm not sure how much of that program has been implemented, but there's some, but I've read that and there's some very good suggestions in there that we need to, to take heed as it relates to our budget and how we determine what dollars are going to go where. This should be uh, on halcyon days for higher education. Um, we have not we haven't had a situation where a governor has said, let's, re let's invest in higher education like we have right now since the Foster days, when we really had <laughs> dramatic progress budgetarily with infusing dollars into higher education. It, these ought to be our great days, yet they are mo our most challenging days legislatively. We have a lot of work to do legislatively. Anybody who deals in governmental relations for these universities and for this system if they're honest, they will tell you, we've got work to do at the legislature. Uh, we have inadvertently and, and perhaps uh, because of some actions taken, um, created some situations that need to be addressed and need to be corrected. The university president needs to be someone who understands the dynamics of that body, knows the players, knows the people, has the credibility and the integrity and the trustworthiness and the vision to be able to communicate in a very honest way about what needs to be done on campus and, and importantly, what needs to be done from a budgetary standpoint, because that's the, always the big driver in legislative discussions is how the dollars are spent and, and are the dollars gonna be wasted? Are the dollars gonna go into the classroom? Are they gonna go for administration? Whatever the case may be. So um, I understand the funding opportunities that may be available for the university. I understand the dynamics that are at play right now. And I'm excited about the prospect of taking on that challenge and dealing with this challenge and recognizing the important things on a university campus are three things, pretty obviously, people, equipment, and facilities. And we have to invest in all three of those things in a responsible way on all eight of our campuses. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chancellor Clark. Uh, Supervisor Valencia Jones. Thank you. Commissioner. Please discuss your commitment to an experience enhancing diversity, including diversity as it relates to underrepresented groups, as well as diversity of thought, experience, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. This, this really centers around the word I mentioned earlier about, about culture. Um, it is a culture that is driving much of the discussion regarding diversity today. And, and let me just make this, this observation. Um, we're undergoing, I think right now nationally, Kind of a cultural metamorphosis. Um, it is it has resulted in um, a lot of the political dynamics that have divided our country. Um, it is manifested in the challenges that COVID has brought to us. That we'll talk about in just a little while. The isolationism that 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 has brought on, um, and it's it's magnified. I think the importance and the need uh, for diversity in the country. A university campus is a marketplace for ideas. It is a, a, an opportunity for free expression, and I fully believe in that. And I mentioned the, this cultural divide that's taken place because right now the, the, the tension between Republicans and Democrats nationally and the tension between the, the woke culture and the cancel culture are at direct odds. And it's like nobody wants to listen 
nobody wants to communicate, nobody wants to talk. Everybody is dug in and believes that their position is right and anybody that doesn't feel that way is wrong and is not worthy of listening to. So I, I, I make those initial comments because I think that's an, it, it's an important insight as to the, the relatively low tolerance that we have for each other right now that's got to change and it's only gonna change through listening and communicating. And that I think is at the very heart of the challenges we face from a diversity standpoint um, on campus. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the diversity that I have attempted to achieve in each of the jobs that I have held, each of the management jobs that I have held as Secretary of State, as Lieutenant Governor and running the Department of Culture, Recreation and Tourism, and now as the, the Commissioner of Administration. And, and that is not going to change. I'm going to con continue uh, that emphasis and that desire to have a diverse employment base at the highest possible level so that the perceived leadership of the university uh, reflects exactly what we're talking about. Um, I, I need to tell you about this because this is a particular insight that I think I, I bring to this job. I, as many of you know, I created a presentation called Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi. It is not grammatically correct, but it is a look at Louisiana and why we are the, unlike any other state in the country, and we are. And it's easy to understand, and the, the sum and substance of it is, there's no ethnic majority in Louisiana. Uh, other Southern states in particular, um, 80 plus percent white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, 20 some odd percent African-American, a little mix of everything else, and Louisiana is not that. Uh, we'll, it'll be interesting to see the census data when it's released in just a, a few weeks, we hope, I can't wait to see it, to see what the makeup of Louisiana is right now because it is not like the other states. About 40% of us are white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, 32% of us are African-American, and 28% of us are everything else. Uh, largely French and Spanish and Creole, this mix of cultures that entered the New World through New Orleans, Louisiana, not through Ellis Island, and that stays here, and people love it here. And this culture of Louisiana that, is, that makes our politics unique, it makes our culture unique, it makes our festival special, our food spicy, our music unmatched, is all a product of this diversity. And the same holds true for Louisiana State University. We are representative of that cultural mix. Uh, there are HBCUs in this state that are very successful in serving an appropriate mission. There are community colleges in this state that are doing the same thing, two-year campuses. There are some postgraduate opportunities at other campuses, but we have it all. We, we touch everybody from literally from cradle to grave at Louisiana State University. Agriculture hits 4-H students it, it, when they're in high school and continues when they're in college. Our extension services reach everybody. Our, as I mentioned earlier, our two-year institutions provide the type of on-job training. Look at what LSU -E is, was just recognized for us on the paper yesterday for uh, the, the program that they're one of seven institutions in the country uh, that is dealing with rural learning in a, in a way that translates into the workforce, into jobs. And then, of course, we have the flagship university in the Baton Rouge campus that's uh, got everything an undergraduate and a graduate student could want. And then we've got our postgraduate school, graduate school here, and we've got the medical schools, two medical schools, training professionals, allied professionals, hopefully to stay in Louisiana. And, and by the way, Louisiana and Pennsylvania go back and forth with the most people who live in the state where they were born because they don't wanna leave. A lot of Louisiana people, I know we've had the brain drain that we talk about, but we Louisianians love who we are and love where we are. And, and the Louisiana State University embodies that, that sense. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Thank you for spending time with us. And thank you for mentioning the transition team report. We think that's fertile ground for uh, improvements as well. My question to you uh, this afternoon is about COVID-19. COVID-19 has dramatically impacted campus life and daily life. What are your thoughts for the fall semester of 2021 and beyond for extended or new COVID protocols? Thank you, Christelle. Um, you know, I have, I have had a seat at the table 
since last March um, with the governor and with the decision makers who were dealing with the challenges of COVID. Um, I, I have seen it up close and personal. And, you know, I've told people it's kind of amazing that uh, there were about anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 of us that, that gathered on a regular daily basis uh, at the state police headquarters site and nobody fortunately got COVID, nobody got it. Um, but we were witnessing the ravages of it every day and having to make decisions uh, that the governor made and the, and the governor is a strong decision maker as we've certainly seen during this, this process, uh, despite the criticism that is there. And I've certainly watched that process and know that there are difficult decisions ahead for the LSU campuses and for the state as a whole. We are heading in the right direction. We are trending in the right direction. I'm hopeful that in the not too distant future, you're gonna see a further relaxation, but we have to be ever vigilant um, with these new strains and with, these, um, with the fact that COVID hasn't gone away. And, and I think a lot of us have, have felt a freedom that we haven't had for the past year, uh, having been vaccinated and feeling much more comfortable in interacting with people, but we nevertheless can't let our guard down. My hope and my expectation is that we will be back uh, to on-campus learning and teaching and instruction on our campuses this fall. It is too early, I think, to say that definitively because these decisions are evolving literally on a, on a week to week or every two week basis. We have several months uh, before school convenes in the fall that we've got to look at the data and understand what we're doing. Um, but my hope is that, and I know the expectation and hope of many legislators and talking to them and listening to them is that our campuses across the state are going to be back to in-person learning uh, this fall. Uh, that's going to depend though, and we'll have to wait and see. Um, there's going to be, I think, ongoing uh, screening that's going to be taking place, vaccination opportunities, assessments of, of what future pandemics may look like that are going to dr drive the determinations of where we go next. Uh, but this is, this is another important thing to remember, I think, with COVID. If March of last year, let's say February of last year, before the pandemic hit, if the governor of this state or the president of the university or anybody had stood up and said to the faculty senator, said to the student body or said to the people of Louisiana, we are gonna convert to online learning in Louisiana. And in the next two or three weeks, or four weeks at the most, you've got to be prepared to do that. And that's just the way it is. Sorry, there would have been a hue and cry that would have never subsided. It would be impossible to do. There's no way we can make a transition like that. There's no way uh, that can be accommodated from a physical standpoint, from an emotional standpoint. But what happened? It's exactly what happened. And it's a credit to universities across the state. It's a credit to LSU. It's a credit to the LSU faculty and leadership on how that university responded and was able to maintain an educational system in the throes of a pandemic. It wasn't perfect by any stretch and it's not the way we'd like to do it, but it happened. And COVID is, and this is a pretty pretty obvious statement, I'm, I'm, I don't take any, any pride of authorship in making this observation, but COVID is going to change the world. Uh, we are never going to go back to doing business the way we have done business because we have experienced how business can be done in the throes of a pandemic. It is going to affect buildings on campuses. It is going to affect state buildings. It is going to affect businesses in general. It's going to have a profound impact on real estate because entities are going to go to some component of working at home. And there are those who want to see that happen in perpetuity. And it's, it's, not gonna necessarily happen in perpetuity on a widespread basis, but it is gonna happen in many respects for people who are capable of doing their jobs without having to be in an office setting. We're engaged right now in the infancy of a study that I've started within the Division of Administration to figure out how this is impacting our state workforce. Because I can tell you, it's been very popular with people who have worked at home and managers are saying it's worked and managers are saying they, that it's, it's been successful. And we're saying, let's look at the accountability. Let's look at what we're able to do in managing people. Let's look at what's been missing because of the human interaction that takes place around uh, the coffee pot or in break rooms or in the direct communication that people have in speaking to one another. Um, but that long-term impact of COVID is going to be with us. And I answer your question that way to say that it's gonna be important for the university to be far forward thinking in that regard and to 
um, to talk about what worked and what didn't work and to think about strategically how we can utilize dollars on a wiser basis to take advantage of some of the lessons learned during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Kazalot? Oh, I apologize, Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. We'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank you and your family for the years of your public service. They have been exemplary and we understand the commitment and sacrifices for families uh, like yours. We're also uh, well aware of your expertise in administering with the executive and legislative branches of the governments, the finances of the state. But we, we would like for you this afternoon for a few minutes to discuss your fundraising experiences and any thoughts on additional revenue generation opportunities. And if you would, uh, any demonstrated examples that you, that you have for us. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I, I will give you several. And again, I have to hearken back to my days on the LSU campus. Uh, um, that's what, that was my real introduction to fundraising. Um, I, I was in charge of an event called the LSU Charity Marathon. It was a nonstop seven day, 24 hour a day flag football game on the LSU parade ground designed to raise money for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, we raised about $26,000, which was at that time, the second highest amount raised in the country for any particular event for a nonprofit entity. Um, as a result of that, um, I got very involved with the Muscular Dystrophy Association for whom that event was sponsored. And um, I, I was asked to serve on the National Youth Committee, uh, which I did for a year. And then I was asked to become the National Youth Chairman for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. I succeeded Jerry Lewis's son. It had always been a celebrity. Patty Duke and Jerry Mathers, the Beaver, and others had been the National Youth Chairman for MDA. And I was asked to take on that responsibility while I was an undergraduate. And I and I did so, and that was my introduction to fundraising, not just on a campus setting, but on a national basis, working with young people across the country on high school campuses and college campuses to raise money for non the nonprofit entity, the Muscular Dystrophy Association. So I cut my teeth on fundraising at a, at a very early age, and uh, it certainly was a, has been a big part of what I've done throughout my life, working with a number of nonprofit entities, and, and obviously no secret being in the political sector. I've had to raise money um, to run campaigns. I, I never borrowed a nickel to run for public office. I, when I decided to, to uh, become a candidate for the first time, I made a commitment to my family and to myself that I was not going to ever borrow money. If people wanted to support me, that would be great, and I'd be successful in, in that regard. And fortunately, people were responsive, and I've, I've raised millions and millions of dollars for uh, what would have been five statewide campaigns um, four of which were successful, and, um, and I, I spent that money on campaign purposes. But um, so that got me used to asking for money, and, and I didn't like it. It's no secret. It's hard to raise money as a political candidate. I hate raising money for myself, but I love raising money for other things. And I think a very significant component of this job, particularly the presidency of the system, has got to be a, a commitment to aggressive fundraising. The president of the university is going, needs to be the face of LSU's fundraising, along with some of our illustrious alums who need to be engaged to help us because we've got a long way to go in the private fundraising sector. I think as we all know, um, the, the foundation has got great leadership right now and I think it's got a, a good plan to, to move us forward in fundraising. But if the president of the university is not an active and aggressive part of that effort, um, I, see it, I see it failing. Um, and I, I've also been involved in fundraising efforts in my capacity as, as Secretary of State. Um, shortly after I was elected, Coach Eddie Robinson passed away, and I made a statement on the floor of the House of Representatives that we were going to build the Eddie Robinson Museum in Grambling, Louisiana. And I helped with that effort to make that museum a reality, and it is now a great tribute to one of Louisiana's greatest native sons, a Baton Rouge native who won 408 college football games and who's for whom the Coach of the Year trophy is named. Um, we celebrate his life and it took some money to do that. 
Um, also, as, as Secretary of State, I, I decided the old state capital, which I mentioned earlier, need a, needed a sprucing up. It had had a change in its, uh, in its uh, interior for years. And so I went out and raised a, a significant amount of money in order to go to the governor and go to the legislature and say, give us some money to update the old state capital, which we did while I was Secretary of State, raised well over a million dollars in the private sector to make that happen. And we now have a program there called the Spirit of the Old State Capital. If you hadn't seen it, I encourage you to go by there and see it. It's, a, it's an internationally award-winning um, 3D presentation about Sarah Morgan, whose family donated the land on which the Old State Capital was built. And it celebrates her oversight of the Old State Capital during all its trials and tribulations. So um, I do know a little bit about raising money. I think it's an important aspect of this job, and I can assure you I'll be calling all of you looking for contributions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Chair-elect Starnes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Commissioner, what is your vision for the success of LSU athletics and its role in the holistic development of student athletes. Well, neither you or I have any eligibility left, I know, so we're not gonna be able to directly uh, contribute to it, but uh, if, you can, if you can see over my shoulder, I, I, I have to, I am a huge LSU athletics fan and, and I always have been. My, my dad, I mentioned earlier, was a ticket taker and an usher for 40 years at every LSU sporting event. Uh, uh, he used to like to say that he uh, he drank coffee with Charlie Mack before on every home game, and he was the first, and Skip Burton will tell you this, he was the first person Skip Burton met when he came to LSU for an interview and went to Alec Box Stadium, and my dad was there as the person who greeted him and took him around the, the box. But um, uh, LSU athletics is a part of my my DNA, obviously, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan, and I, I recognize that the athletic department is one of the premier athletic departments in the country. It competes at a national level, whereas academically and research-wise, we do not. And we've got to aspire for the same success in academia and research as we do in athletics. We have a very low tolerance for failure in athletics, but we have unfortunately uh, not been willing to make the kind of investments we need to make elsewhere. Um, I think that, and I don't mean this to be flippant in, that in, when I say this, but athletics is going to take care of itself. Uh, the TAF has been a tremendous um, opportunity for uh, fundraising to, to support the athletic department. Uh, I think the leadership of the athletic department recognizes uh, what it's got to do to keep up. It, it is an arms race. Um, I, I remember the, the whole discussion about Tiger Stadium when I was in the Senate and when, when the addition was made and TAF was created. And you have to continue to invest in athletics and all the bells and whistles and all the coaches like we're doing today with the announcement uh, to make certain, certain that your program continues to, to excel. Um, our athletes are put on pedestals in Louisiana. They certainly are at LSU. When you get to wear that jersey or don that uniform, uh, what I look forward to telling those players, if I'm fortunate enough to be in this position, is that you're the luckiest people on this campus uh, because you get to wear that uniform and people get to come and cheer for you, uh, whatever your event may be not like they do in the classroom where people who excel uh, don't have people sitting there cheering and yelling and knowing their every name, uh, but you do. And so we've got to continue that, that legacy of excellence and I think we will. Um, I think it's important to, to mainstream as much as possible athletes into the operation of the university community. Um, you know, they obviously have to work hard and they obviously live in a bubble in many respects, not just a COVID bubble, but a bubble of their teammates and their coaches because so much of their time has to be devoted um, to athletics. Um, and I, in fact, I, I kind of had to make that decision myself. When Dale, when I graduated from high school, Dale Brown asked me to walk on the LSU basketball team in 1972. Uh, I was at a crossroads having to decide. I was a little scrawny uh, guard who knew what knew my role would be and it would be hustling just like his team hustled. But I decided I wanted to go a different route as a student. I recognized had I gone that way, I would not have been able to pursue other activities that I was interested in on campus. And um, athletes in many respects are, are limited in what they can do because of the time they have to spend. But uh, I think they need to be integrated more into the operation of the university. Um, I, I worry frankly a little bit about um, the future of, of some of the issues we're gonna be facing as it relates to 
the transfer, por transfer portal. Um, it makes us a little bit more like pro teams where you don't know what jersey somebody's got on, whereas it used to be when you signed a kid for a scholarship, he was going to be your guy. But now transfer portal, thank God we love it. It got, brought us some great players and it will bring us a lot more. Uh, but that's a dynamic that, that I think diminishes the identity that people have with their athletes. And that's unfortunate, but it's reality. We have to deal with it. We have to find a way to, uh, to overcome that. The same holds true for what is clearly the future of compensation for athletes, which is going to allow them the opportunity to, to receive some compensation for their name and from, for their likeness. And that is going to separate superstars and individuals in smaller sports. It won't just be football. It'll be a lot of the smaller sports as well that we don't often think of who are going to have tremendous sponsorship opportunities, be it gymnastics or volleyball or golf. Um, and, and those are, again, the realities that I think is going to ultimately be decided by the Supreme Court, by the United States Congress, by the NCAA, whoever it may be. That's a new dynamic that is injecting itself into athletics on campuses across the country. And again, we need to be proactive and not reactive. We need to be as much ahead of the curve on these issues as we can possibly be. And, and that's a, a challenge I look forward to as a, as a diehard sports fan and an LSU person. Thank you, Chair Lex Starnes. Commissioner Darden, in the last 10 minutes we have remaining, what questions do you have for us as a committee? I have a couple of questions. And, and obviously these are questions that are also gonna be directed to the board. And so those of you board members obviously on the committee can, can chime in. But uh, the first question is by what standards and within what time frame should my success as president and chancellor be measured? Uh, and I know you started that out by saying it was directed to the board, but, uh, you know, one observation from the earlier session is that we really do need to get input from the other, the other members of the committee. I think our, our board chairman, Robert Damp, did a phenomenal job uh, getting a cross section of people for the committee. And that's the input I think is most important. Um, and so I'd like to hear an answer from someone who's not on the board of supervisors today to that question. By what Don't standards me. and within what time frame should my success be measured? Don't make me call on somebody like law school, just volunteer. <laughs> I can start, but other people will follow too. Um, this is Gabriela Gonzalez. I, uh, I think that it's, uh, we are looking for uh, leadership and we are looking for uh, short-term goals as well as a vision for uh, long-term goals but nothing is instantaneous. So we are not going to measure success in a one year time scale. but we think that in five years, it will be the right time frame to see that progress uh, has started, change has started to happen. That's a time frame uh, I and colleagues of mine have in mind. Um, the other part of the question was metrics. <laughs> Is, yeah, by what, by what standards, uh, like, right. like we want to measure standards, and by what standards should the president be measured? And uh, again, uh, representing my colleagues, uh, I, we look for national visibility. We are the state flagship uh, university. We are very proud of that. But we have a much larger ambition. We want to be visible in all aspects, not just in athletics at the national level. And that is something that in a few years time scale can begin to happen. Thank you. And, th and thank you for uh, the great luster you have brought to this university with your work. Thank you. You know, one of the things I'd like to add as, as a Dean, um, and you mentioned this earlier, it's critically important that we've got to grow the faculty We've celebrated our enrollment growth, but that has not been reflected the same way amongst our faculty. So, I mean, you talked about it. There's one thing to have significant administrative support, but we fill it in a classroom. That ties back to your reference to our, um, our desire to grow our research productivity. So attracting faculty. Um, and then I'd also like to reference um, one of our board of supervisor members brought that up. We've also got to diversify the faculty to, to reflect the diversity of the students that we serve now as we've grown our population. Um, so as we're bringing new faculty and staff, and we'd also hope that 
the faculty and students that are, or the faculty and staff that are already here that are amongst the diverse groups have the opportunity for, um, to grow, more grow, growth opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. And, and you reminded me in, in your comments, something I, I, I don't think I mentioned in, in talking about faculty involvement and, and uh, what have you, and that, that is relative to admissions. Um, the faculty obviously needs to be greatly involved in admission determinations. And I know that's where King got into some trouble over the course of the past couple of years in, in the zeal to drive numbers because numbers drive money and more money for the university. And we all want higher enrollment. That's a, an obvious tension that, that has to be address between driving numbers up but maintaining high admission standards and and making certain that we comply with our own standards but also are in, in comport with what the board of regents has set out and there's been some detente in that issue that was a kind of a flashpoint a while back but i i mentioned that because you reminded me how important i think it is for for the, uh, the faculty to be involved in all discussions relative to academia particularly admissions yes, sir. dr johnson Commissioner, within 30 days, there should be a change in energy and buoyancy in the university itself set by the new leadership. And then I believe in three year, five year increments, we should compare ourselves to national standards at universities such as ourselves. For instance, in healthcare alone, LSU, the two uh, health sciences centers with the, the energy that we have and the expertise that we have, we should be able to help the state of Louisiana in our health standards vis-a-vis -vis other states nationally. We have not, at one time, uh, medicine in Louisiana was looked at as, as a standard nationally. For whatever reason, we've lost some of our direction uh, in the last decades, and we look to someone to help us find our way. No, thank you. And I, I certainly agree wholeheartedly. I mean, uh, uh, we ought to be aspiring to be uh, an AAU institution. I mean, I know we're a long way from that and that's not gonna happen overnight by any stretch, but that ought to be a goal of the flagship university of, of this state. And as I mentioned earlier, you, you alluded to as well, the, the potential we have through Pennington and through the two medical schools from a, not only a healthcare delivery standpoint and improving the lot and life of Louisianians when it comes to obesity and diabetes and, and other diseases, but through research and through a coordinated research effort um, that, that involves all three of those institutions. And I know there's been a lot of talk on campus and I'll mention this, I didn't mention this either, but I'll mention now, a lot of discussion on campus and in Washington about a, a National Cancer, Cancer Institute designation. Uh, we have a cancer consortium in Louisiana that we've already invested in heavily. And LSU New Orleans is a part of that with Oshner and Xavier and others. And, and we need to take advantage of that type of collaboration with other institutions um, to achieve that long-term goal. It's a long way away. We know that, but we've got to lay the groundwork now for that type of designation. And I know that's something Senator Cassidy has been interested in. I know the campus has been interested in it. And we have been interested in it at the division level. Uh, because we recognize the potential that is there through the collaboration uh, that already exists. Steve Nelson, I was actually, uh, you know, interested in trying to work for NCI over 10 years ago. You know, where the, uh, if you look at us, uh, Mississippi doesn't have one, Arkansas doesn't have one, they all would like to have one. I think LSU is perfectly uh, in a great position to do that, looking at health disparities and everything else. I think one of the things that we don't do as well as we should is work as a system, you know, work with our partner institutions, more alliances with, uh, you know, the Health Sciences Center, Pennington, the undergraduate campus, because to me, true creativity comes from bringing different views together and looking at things in a new and fresh way. And so if you could get the campuses to work more together, provide resources and initiatives for them to work more together, I think it would catapult us. And I think what you talk about is aspiring to get us back into the top 100 or the top 50 would also be recognized nationally as LSU is back. This is where we need to be. And, and you used a word that I, I should have used and, and meant to use in the description about leadership and that is creativity. Uh, I've tried to bring creativity to every job that I've had and would, would wanna bring it to this job as well because Oftentimes in government, uh, you know, it's very difficult to sometimes break out of the mold and be creative, but uh, 
um, that's that's just part of my background. I'm, I'm an advertising journalism graduate of the Manship School before it was the Manship School, and and I have always felt it important to to use humor and creativity uh, as part of your leadership skills. And so you mentioning that word reminded me that I failed to. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to throw that in. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at 3:45. I think unless the Parker folk come on and tell me otherwise. I think uh, that means we are at the conclusion of the interview. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to visit with you. I thank you again for your involvement in this process. And the next question I was going to ask was, will all of you agree to be part of my listening tour? So I'll be calling on you if I'm fortunate enough to hold this position. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Mr. Darden, you can go ahead and exit the link and we're going to hold on here if you don't mind. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Chairman Williams, um, we just had a couple of things that we wanted to say before you guys break for the day, but I'll follow your lead. No, please go, go on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you made it through the first day. Congratulations. I know it can be a long day, but you got into a good rhythm, which is great. So we just wanted to remind you of a couple of things. One, um, that I know there had been some discussion in the past as it relates to the 30th uh, for a meeting on the 30th to have a conversation about candidates. We're actually going to have that conversation tomorrow. So I just wanted to remind you that at the end of the last interview tomorrow, we will begin that process that we talked talked about this morning of discussing candidates and for you to make your decision of, of which unranked candidates you'd like to present to the full board. I also wanted just to remind you that there are various steps in this process as it relates to vetting candidates. I know there were some conversations earlier about when are we going to ask questions about certain things that may be an individual's background. And I just want to re-emphasize to you that we are right now beginning the vetting of candidates, conducting all of the different background checks that need to be done. There will be a part of this that's about vetting and asking you know, additional questions and referencing of candidates. Obviously, there's another step in this process that we talked about this morning where we can get into a little more detail as it relates to anything in someone's background that you may have an interest in asking. So I did want to just remind you as committee members, it may have seemed rushed today, but there's more to this process that's being done behind the scenes as well as will continue to be done uh, as you start to make your decisions as to who those candidates are that you'll be moving forward to the next round of interviews. Uh, just also want to remind you that tomorrow morning, morning starts promptly at 9 a.m. So we'll have the candidate ready and prep. So if you'll all be there a few minutes before that so that we can get that started on time. Uh, we do have a, a long day tomorrow. We have five candidates scheduled. We were able uh, to go back based on today's decision of the committee to invite Dr. Tate in for an interview. We were able to get him scheduled for tomorrow. So if you'll just be ready around 845 to, to get ready to start Start to interviewing these candidates, that would be outstanding. So um, that's the update Portia. Did I miss anything that we just wanted to remind the committee about today? That's it. All right. So I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Williams. Perfect. Thank you all as always. I'll continue to say Parker has done just an amazing job for us and uh, we continue to be very appreciative of the work you've done. Um, thank you all for everything today. I do want to remind you that uh, we have an opportunity. We'll get together this evening at, uh, at 430 at the foundation building. I know it was originally 530, but we finished earlier than anticipated. So rather than have a big long gap, we will just uh, make our way over to the foundation building and they should be expecting us at 430. We're catching them a little off guard, so be patient as they pull it together, but I thought it'd be better for us to, to get together sooner rather than later. So I look forward to fellowshipping with y'all and relaxing and talking about everything except this. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so uh, general counsel, are we in recess or are we adjourning? We are technically recess. So motion to recess until tomorrow morning. All right, I'll entertain a motion to recess the search committee meeting until tomorrow morning. Moved by Ms. Slaughter, second by Professor Gonzalez. Any opposition? 
Seeing and hearing none, the motion carries. We'll stand in recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.